Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, yeah, so obviously Amelia and I are here to give you a bit of a presentation on sibling this evening. Um, we would like to also reiterate Rory's acknowledgement um, of country and um, acknowledge that we are on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country and pay our respects to their elders past and present. So Sibling as a studio um, started about 10 years ago or just over 10 years ago and we formed as a group of friends and we all met here at this very university. Um, and so this is a photo of us in one of the very first projects we built in a warehouse in Fitzroy. Um, and I guess just take a look around at the people sitting next to you. Are these people you want to get into business with? Because <laughs> um, it is a bit like a marriage, so think about it. Um, <laughs> So I guess in our instance, we decided to go into business together. Um, and there were eight of us in the practice when we uh, first began. So today, uh, as was mentioned, there are four of those original eight still going strong in the practice. Um, and this is us with our team, some additional siblings that we've gathered along the way. Um, and we have studios both here in Nam um, in Melbourne and in Gadigal land uh, in Sydney. So to begin, we'll give you a brief history of the timeline um, of sibling. Um, and I guess this gives you a bit of an idea of the progression of the practice from 2008 um, to now. So 2008 was when we first started. So back in 2008, I guess we began as friendship. It began as a friendship at university. We were sharing a studio together uh, in the city. We were spending a lot of time um, together. And in 2008, we all graduated from university here and we all, I guess some of us went overseas to gain experience in uh, practices in Europe. Um, some of us stayed here and I guess we all went out and gained uh, lots of different experience. And at the same time as doing that, we were also working in our time off as, a, as this collective known as um, Sibling Nation at the time. And we were working uh, mainly on small scale installation projects and they were often in galleries or via things like street performances in the procession you can see up on the screen there. So in 2012, um, a few of the directors uh, finished working in different practices um, and established uh, Sibling. And we began working full time in the practice. And at that point, we were working on a lot of, again, exhibition designs, um, including uh, part of Melbourne Now, the original one. We did the reading room, uh, exhibition designs at uh, RMIT Design Hub, we worked on Sugar Mountain Festival and some uh, installations at Fed Square as well. So in 2015 we formalised the structure of the, um, the business, it sort of had all been quite loose up until that point and so we formalised with a, into a company um, <clears throat> which you'll learn as you go through registration is a, as an important part of the um, evolution of an architecture practice and we were working in a range of different contexts but at the start it was um, quite a lot of education work. Um, by 2017 <coughs> we expanded the practice uh, to Sydney and we opened the Sydney studio um, where Chen Yi remains today with a small uh, group of staff up there as well. So it's yeah, now been over a decade of sibling um, and we're working on a range of different projects but I guess the point really is that we came together as a group of friends and individuals who shared a similar outlook um, to life and the way that we think about design. Cool, so I'm going to talk you through um, a little bit about the project mix that we're working on um, in the studio at the moment. So this timeline represents, I guess, what the traditional or common, I guess, um, evolution of an architecture practice might be when you graduate uni. So a lot of people take the path of, I guess, working on single residential um, projects or, um, yeah, residential alts and ads. And I guess working through residential and then kind of moving to multi-res and then finally working more into civic and public if that's um, the kind of way that the practice wants to go. And I guess, yeah, our um, path was slightly different to this. So because of that, I guess, origin that we were talking about where we started working more in sort of arts and projects and research projects, um, the path was slightly different for us. So we started off doing those kinds of projects and then moved into more commercial, then education, then, then resi, and then, yeah, moving more into civic and public projects. And I guess that meant that for a lot of time, the scale of project that we were working on was a bit smaller to start with because we were really trying to crack into that public um, sort of 
those public projects, which isn't easy to do when you start off. Um, so yeah, it took us quite a, lot, a while, but we've finally gotten there. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, the, the self-initiated research projects that we started on. So these are projects that have no client um, and they were sort of driven by us completely. Um, on the right hand side there, you can see a project where we made a Faraday cage to think about how you might disconnect in space. Um, here are some of the commercial projects that we work on in the office. It's a mixture of yeah, offices, restaurants, retail, and yeah, I guess what we love about these kinds of projects is the speed in which they're done. Um, they're very fast and quick turnaround, and they allow us to explore ideas in quite a fast way, which is quite a nice, I guess, antithesis to how very slow and long most of the architectural processes can be. Um, and then, yeah, moving into education. So what really helped our practice enormously at the beginning were some projects that we were given um, by Monash University. So doing a lot of student spaces in the university there, which led us to then sort of build on that experience and work a lot in education. Um, so we've worked quite a bit in yeah, RMIT, Monash. We're starting to do a small project here at Melbourne Uni as well. Um, but we'll talk you through some of those education projects a bit more. Um, this is some of the resi work that we do. So a mixture of new dwellings, additions, and we've recently just started to work on some multi-res as well. And finally, the sort of civic or public projects that we've been working on. Um, and this really includes a range of different arts and cultural projects, performing arts. And yeah, so it's through those projects, I guess you can see a bit of an evolution of our studio and the types of projects that we have taken on so far. For all of the projects, we always hope that the design outcome reflects the values that we share within the studio. And I guess, yeah, articulating our values is something that we've been working on and something that's an ongoing process that we sort of continually do with ourselves and with our studio. And we'll just talk a bit more about the values of the practice now. Yeah, so the first um, value we call positive places. Um, so I guess what does, what does that mean? So for us, this is really a multifaceted uh, approach to, to, to the value that we put um, across the practice. And it's about being socially engaged, culturally enriching and sustainable in sort of a multifaceted way um, as well. And we try to cultivate this not only in the studio life, but in all the, obviously in all the projects we do, but also in the studio life. So we've always been interested in the social um, and I guess and how architecture can play a role in creating and encouraging positive social engagements within our projects. And whether that be through um, a community coming together or encouraging friendly, neighbourly interactions, as you can start to see here. Um, and this is a project that we completed for Arts Projects Australia. Um, Arts Projects is a, this is their renovation space for their space in Northcote. Um, Arts Projects is a creative um, and social enterprise um, that supports artists with intellectual disabilities. Um, and so this was all about creating a new uh, entry space into their Northcote home, creating a sense of calm, but also highlighting some of the DDA requirements that you have to put into projects, so making them a custom part of the project rather than being an addition um, at the end, just as a bit of an afterthought. Sustainability um, is essential to, to what we're doing. We're currently in the process of developing our sib sibstainability action <laughs> plan, is what we're trying to call it. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, this is all about minimising, obviously, the impact that architecture has um, in the art environment. And so this is an ongoing um, process within the studio um, that obviously feeds into all of our projects and processes. Um, and further to, I guess, sustainability is this idea of connecting with country. So that's an, also an important part of what we're um, interested in as a practice. Um, and this project here is called uh, Over Obelisk, and it challenged I guess, the colonial histories that were um, located on the John Batman um, obelisk there um, and really reframed the ideas and worked with the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung to create um, language and messages that could challenge these histories that I think claimed that um, the lands of Melbourne were unoccupied at the time of settlement. So many of our projects also uh, engage with traditional owners and that's really about embedding um, their culture, um, I guess the culture and histories and storytelling into the projects as well. Yeah, so the next one is beyond buildings. Um, and I guess what we mean by that is 
the, this kind of value talks about the essence of our practice when we first began, so that idea of research and self-initiated projects. Um, we always have a strong interest in architecture beyond, I guess, the four walls of a building. So that means that we like to think about the wider implications of architecture beyond just the immediate projects we have or the brief that a client might give us. Um, and this is done through the practice, through events, talks and research projects. So, yeah, we have an ongoing research arm that has always maintained throughout the practice and we have, um, we've always got a self-initiated research project going on um, at a particular time. So this was an event called What Matters, which was ho hosted at the NGV as part of Design Week. Um, for this event, we invited different architects and academics and students to come along and each tell us what matters to them. So the format was quite short and snappy and everyone was given a few minutes to sort of talk about what matters to them. And yeah, what came about was really interesting. It was, you know, different issues from housing crisis to feeling safe in public bathrooms to getting enough sleep as a new parent whilst being an architect. <laughs> Um, this is New Agency, so this was a large-scale research self-initiated project that looked at the future of ageing. Um, and we looked at how home ownership is intrinsically linked to how people age in this country. We researched a whole bunch of different case studies of models that challenge um, this kind of model around the world. Ooh. Yeah. Um, we interviewed people who live in multi-generational homes and we interviewed grey nom nomads who also have more of a mobile dwelling condition. And we asked people to imagine their future and provide us with a vision of how they could see living in an alternative way in the future. So uh, I think the last value that we'll talk about is fun and inquisitive spaces. And I guess there's really a desire in a lot of our projects to create spaces that are fun and put a smile on everyone's face. Um, and it's really about creating unexpected experiences um, and to ex inspire people who use the spaces that we design for. And really is about this celebration of difference across all of the projects as well. So a project that speaks to this value is a project we did for the NGV for um, the Triennale. I think it was at the end of 21 or 2020. Um, and it was called Boudoir Babylon. It was a collaboration with Adam Nathaniel Furman from the UK. So the project was part, um, yeah, as I mentioned, of the Triennale and it overtook the, um, the gallery's cafe and it really began to look at different architect three different architectural typologies, um, the boudoir, the salon and the, the nightclub, and really was about, these were all about spaces that challenge and rethink how people come together and socialise in space and so starting to apply that um, in the cafe there and creating a different set of experiences. There was a range of different events um, that occurred, including, including dance performances across um, the installation. So this is another project that we worked on um, for a client in, she was an occupational therapist um, and it was her home office or a family home office. It was also her home. Um, and they, she specialised in working with um, catastrophically injured and impaired children and adults and their rehabilitation. Um, and so the office was conceived as a playful yet calming domestic space for her to operate in. Um, and I guess the idea of the project was to um, facilitate all levels of abilities. And here's a couch that we designed that can form into the shape of a pizza. It also has grab rails on one of them. So for people who are, um, I guess, have mobility issues, they can also get onto the couch. Um, with ease. Cool, yeah. so yeah, we're going to talk you through three projects in a bit more detail just so you can kind of get a bit more of an idea into how we approach a design. So the first project is the RMIT Rodder Lane project. Um, this project was completed about two years ago and it's really more of a sort of urban design project um, that stitches together a series of disparate places in the city campus of RMIT University. So, yeah, as I mentioned, the project is about transforming underutilised spaces into more of sort of welcoming places on the campus. It's really about the spaces in between, about injecting life into disused and leftover space and how, I guess, habitation within these spaces can bring life back into the campus. Um, this project started quite a few years back, so back in 2017, um, and it was an invited competition for emerging architects. So it was really an amazing opportunity for us because we'd only really established our practice three years prior. Um, and so, yeah, to be able to have so, 
such an opportunity to contribute to that site was pretty amazing. So yeah, this is the um, location of the site. So it's situated in the RMIT city campus, as I said, in the laneways and courtyards, um, tucked behind building eight and story hall. I guess the key drivers for the project were again about these leftover spaces, but also how to unify them for the campus and connect them back to the city. Um, the space is made up of two courtyards. They're sort of linked by this narrow laneway. So you can see in the site pictures there. So that's one of the existing main courtyards. Um, and you can see it's heavily sort of punctuated by that stair that comes down from Story Hall. So that was really disruptive into the space. And at the um, in, at the beginning of the project, there was a mixture of, I guess, a patchwork of different floor finishes and materials. This is the second triangular courtyard, which was also quite basic. And I guess what struck us about it was that um, all of these spaces had really great verticality to them, and they were often viewed from above by the buildings around. And then, yeah, these two courtyards were joined by these quite skinny back of house narrow laneways that were quite, um, quite dark and they sort of had the feeling that they were quite unsafe at night. So lighting also became quite an important consideration. So yeah, at the outset there were quite a few challenges and I guess one of the other big challenges for us was about how to best respond to the site where there was such a strong multi-layered architectural palette and context. Um, so I guess in response we wanted to create these two clear focal points. Um, two anchors or social zones that would sort of be places for, to pause and inhabit. We wanted to bring all of the disparate elements together through this unified ground plane. And then so the way that we did that was by introducing this custom concrete paver that provided this rhythmic direction and wayfinding to the site. They provided a sense of movement through the site and then turned into this concentric zone where we wanted people to pause and sort of inhabit the social spaces. So yeah, in the courtyards, there's a focus on habitation at the human scale, um, providing different seats and tables and planters and introducing different shade structures. And yeah, hues of blue, light gray and white were deliberately chosen to contrast the existing really warm palette. Yeah, the pattern of paving is then uh, projected up onto this, the multiple different surfaces, onto the seats, onto the steel tables, the shade structures, and onto the stairs. And the different shade structures punch up to different heights to engage with the existing sort of conditions and the different volumes within the space. And the shade structures provide a sense of enclosure and protection and intimacy to the site. So this just shows some of the moments of habitation defined by those structures different materials that feed into the patterns. For this narrow laneway that I was showing before, so here we really wanted to accentuate the vertical volume of the space. And so the patterns flip up to extend onto vertical surfaces and create different seating loops that form places to sit. And at a human scale, that kind of color variation and light provides a textural quality to the spaces. Show some of the furniture. Um, for people to be able to sit and dwell. Yeah, here you can really see how, I guess, the ground plane talks to that existing context. Um, you know, there's a conversation, I guess, in the patination between the Corrigan building and the floor, but it's um, distinctly different in terms of its colour and contrasts, that, that warmer brick tone throughout. And yeah, this last image, I guess, shows um, a group of students that we met when we were doing the photo shoot, it was the Australian Manga Appreciation Society. Um, and they had sort of, yeah, found the site and meet, had, were meeting there every, um, every week. And it was one of the different sort of many groups that we witnessed throughout the day. So yeah, we love that um, all the different types of users have started to kind of really um, take over the spaces in between. So Nick's gonna talk you through Darabin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is a project we completed late last year, early this year, um, for the city of Darabin. Um, it's called the Darabin Intercultural Centre. Um, and the key, I guess, message that the centre is trying to deliver is to eliminate discrimination in all of its forms within society. So it's all about um, bringing people together and learning from one another and different cultures across, um, across the community within Darabin. So, 
The site for the project is located right there. We can see the city, the Preston City Hall. So it's located right at the heart um, of the municipality and right at the centre of Darabin. So it's also located on the corner of Gower and High Streets in central Preston, for those who know it. Um, also next to another <coughs> um, prominent intercultural space, the Preston Markets, which um, is sadly at risk of being lost quite soon. So the project um, sits at the corner, as I said, but it inhabits this uh, heritage building. Um, and effectively, the heritage building, the bottom kind of corner here that you can see becomes the new front door for council. So um, it's quite an ambitious, um, I guess, element for council to put forward to say that their intercultural centre effectively becomes uh, their new front door. And so we were dealing, um, I guess, with these quite interesting ideas of interculturalism, but then also having to balance that um, with the heritage of the, of the building as well. As you can see here, some of the interior spaces that we had were pretty inspiring. Um, <laughs> Not really, um, save for, I guess, some of the arched forms and the tile patterns that you can begin um, to see on the floor there. So a really important part of the project was actually this community reference group that we worked with. Um, and so there were eight um, culturally and linguistically diverse community members that we worked with um, to help co-steer um, the project direction. Um, that in also included Wurundjeri Woiwurrung elders. Um, and yeah, we asked lots of different questions. What is interculturalism? What does that mean to you? Why is that not being achieved? What are some of the things in society that stop that from happening and really started to flesh out um, how the centre uh, could begin to, to work for the community members? So the outcome of the, that process was creating a set of guiding principles um, that began to yeah, steer the way that the project uh, moved through its design process. And they were be inclusive while culturally dynamic, unify the spaces between cultures, create transformative spaces, and enable light, warmth, and transparency. And I guess as part of the community reference group process, we we created what the, the council called the precinct blueprint, um, which is effectively the master plan. Um, and you can see here the master plan begins to take over the public realm as well. And it was all about this pushing and curvaceous pulling um, of the floor plan, which was really all about um, drawing the community centre out into the public and also drawing the community into the centre um, as well. So I guess the space, um, as you can sort of see the floor plan here, it's got the, the centre staff and a co-working space over to the left. Um, there's two welcome tables as you enter the space, which I'll show you in a little bit. Um, and then three flexible spaces um, to the end that can be really adapted to a range of different uses by the users um, and a series of different ancillary spaces um, towards the back. And it also connects to the Shire Hall, which effectively becomes an extension of the centre and can um, expand to, to larger events. Um, we had to be quite surgical for this project. Obviously, the guiding principles were about it being light and open and airy. And what we were given was this very compartmentalised heritage building. Um, and an interesting thing that also came out of the community reference group was that the heritage building and what of some of the representations it had felt culturally unsafe to some of the people in the community. So we made this deliberate act to really um, create a very distinct interior space to what was represented on the exterior. So this real change occurs when you come into the space. Um, and I guess to, to achieve that, we created this, I guess, material and textural tapestry um, that is that is located across the floor and then three-dimensional social infrastructures begin to emerge from that um, and as you can sort of see in these diagrams operable walls and curtains really add to the user agency there are um, the whole space can be opened up and become one large event space or it can be broken down into individual spaces on top of that curtains kind of create smaller like uh, intimate uh, movie or you could have a film with say five people Alternatively, it could be the entire community there. Um, so as you approach the, the centre from um, High Street, you're, I guess there's upgraded um, accessibility elements that came into the landscape. So this was also the first stage. So the master plan doesn't include the full um, external element, but hints to it um, in its outcome um, and includes new signage 
um, that I guess hint towards what's going to be inside. Um, and then spaces at the front were also, I guess, dedicated. These, the small spaces you can see in the foreground are dedicated as um, ceremony spaces. So smoking ceremonies and the like take place there. And they had that at the um, opening when we, we went and have used it several times since. Um, as you enter the space, I guess that material tapestry begins to unfold. Um, interestingly, during construction, uh, we found the checkerboard tiles um, as well as the vaulted ceiling. So all of that was covered up by 80s vinyl um, when we first got the space. So there was this um, kind of evolution and discovery through the project as well, um, which was quite interesting. These are the welcome tables, I think, that I mentioned, and that was all about, I guess, um, breaking down this barrier of reception um, and creating an informal and welcoming gesture as people walk into the spaces. Um, yeah, and again, this idea of removing or purging um, the detailing of the interior and then beginning to reveal um, the brickwork uh, underneath and really the bricks are of country. And so it was really about trying to represent within that building um, the, the, the materiality that I guess doesn't speak to that um, colonial history, which you can begin to see here. Obviously you can't get rid of everything. Um, but yeah, and I guess what's interesting about the project is I guess the extension of the market also begins to present itself on High Street and you get these glimpses of the community um, coming back in from within the centre, which is quite beautiful. Um, several of the spaces were named in Wurundjeri language and uh, mean one people, one place, gather as one and our place. And here you can see the co-working space. So the staff um, are located in the centre, so there's not this hierarchical um, space that the, the staff go to, so they all uh, operate in here, and the centre is effectively also a co-working space that the public is invited to come in and use and share with the staff. And you can see a variety of different ways that that begins to work. Um, we started to introduce the idea of mirrored surfaces into the project as well, and that was to deal with thresholds within the project, um, but also, I guess, to conceal some of the services, but it was a deliberate move um, the, the idea of reflection in this project was really about, you know, reminding the community of their importance of inhabiting the space and reflecting that back onto themselves as well. And you can begin to see, um, yeah, the sort of textural element that the reflected ceiling begins to have here. Um, this is a, one of the flexible working spaces. There's a, an orange space and a, and a yellow space, and they have this uh, curvaceous um, acoustic uh, treated wall. Um, which begins to help with some of the acoustic treatments. You can begin to see the, the curtaining here. This is also a stage. Um, so when the, the curtains can be drawn in front of the windows um, and then uh, effectively this becomes the corner stage where the audience can all radiate out from the side and it can begin to facilitate a range of different events. And the, the events and the kind of things that happen in the centre are quite varied, um, how to um, prepare a tax return, um, dance classes, cooking classes, cultural celebrations. It was sort of quite varied in, in what it um, can be. But um, yeah, I guess the space can really be transformed into a multitude of different ways. Um, and the wash of colour throughout, I guess, also is about creating this new sense of identity um, for the community and um, the use of the space. And then that's also uh, projected out onto into the public realm in the evening as well with the lighting and the colours of the space. So the last project we'll talk through. Um, this one's the Box Hill North Primary School. Um, so this was one that we were very fortunate to get an architecture award at this year's AIA Awards. So we were pretty um, chuffed at that. Um, but it's a primary school, obviously, in Box Hill North. Um, it's located in a Eastern, in eastern Melbourne in an established middle ring suburban context, um, just south of the Kunung Kunung Creek, which runs parallel with the Eastern Freeway. Um, so the school lacked kind of a clear street presence and had all of these quite um, average buildings located across it. And so part of the, the process of the project was creating a master plan um, that could help, I guess, create this sense of address um, to the school's entrance, but also upgrade the facilities across the site, given the state that some of those, um, those buildings were in. So I guess 
The, the project that we were looking at is it called the Junior Learning Hub, um, and so it's for prep to grade two students. And so a part of that was really starting to think about the children who would begin to inhabit the buildings. And this was starting to look at the, the local context and the architecture and starting to look at the materials um, of the, I guess, the brick villas that surround the site and starting to bring that materiality into the project to create this sense of familiarity um, when, when the kids came to school and so that it maybe wasn't so daunting. Um, there's a kindergarten located on the site in the centre um, of the site and so there was an old building that uh, extended all the way across and we effectively demolished that building and created a new um, courtyard um, between the kindergarten and the new junior learning hub and that was all about creating the synergy between the kindergarten kids uh, and the prep ones and twos and creating, I guess, um, opportunities also for families to interact and to encourage, I guess, um, kids from the kinder to um, feel comfortable when they were moving into the, um, into the primary school as well. And again, you can start to see how that idea of bringing the forms and um, ideas of the local context into the, to the formal language of the building as well. The floor plan is a staggered floor plan, which is um, across eight classrooms. So it's, a, it's quite a simple building. There are eight classrooms, a staff room, and a couple of toilets, plus uh, a corridor. And the staggering of the floor plan was really about creating a series of neighborhoods um, within the building. So you have, I guess, the, the prep one and the one two classrooms and they create um, yeah, these neighborhoods and the the corridor we really wanted the corridor to be something other than just a corridor we wanted it to be an inhabitable space so that was really often classrooms um, in schools have what they call withdrawal spaces so spaces where students can um, kind of be removed and maybe have quiet time or one-on-one -on -one teaching and so we decided instead of having that within the classrooms putting that into the corridor and making that really, the corridor became, I guess, an education or a pedagogical space within the, within the floor plan as well. Um, the scooped uh, facades at either end, again, were about gathering um, and people coming onto, um, yeah, I guess when you arrive onto the site, creating these gathering spaces within the, within the landscape. Um, the sectional quality of the building <coughs> also begins to, I guess, draw in light, um, so capturing southern light into the, into the classrooms to create really nice and bright um, spaces and also mitigating northern light um, coming into the space, so obviously you can't have too much sun in classrooms like this, but also the pop-ups in the ceiling also create, I guess, opportunities for night purging um, within the project as well. So you, you'll see that the, col the project's quite colourful um, and we drew some inspiration uh, for the colour palette from the adjacent creek that I'd mentioned previously and I guess the different growth stages that Wattle um, goes through along the creek um, and began to apply that to the master plan, um, which effectively works as a, a wayfinding tool and then I guess coupling that with um, yeah, the, the interior palette uh, that you can begin to see here in this AXO. Yeah, so as you enter the site, um, we were lucky to have these beautiful eucalypt trees, which also begin to project a, a lovely dappled light onto the facade in the morning. Um, so you get this projection of the trees onto the building, which is really beautiful. Um, you can start to read that zigzag, zigzagging profile, which also acted as a way to create passive surveillance into the main courtyard as well. So creating these opportunities that teachers could begin to see into the space. Um, and you can really begin to understand, I guess, this lightweight canopy that sits above the, the brick base here, which is starting to reference um, the houses that we see, that we were speaking about, and that's punctuated with these bright orange uh, windows, which again create this sense of identity for the project. Um, yeah, so this is the main entrance space between the kindergarten and the junior learning hub. The kindergarten entry is through the gate, and the learning hub is through the orange um, portal and you can begin to see the full context of the building there. Um, and yeah, I guess, again, these warm colours and textures really were about creating this inviting space, but also, I guess, the three-dimensional elements of the brick um, units within the landscape were also moments of respite and kind of elements for play within the um, play and gathering within the, um, that, that area of the, the entry. 
So as you walk into the building, I guess the, the curvaceous forms on the exterior begin to be translated to the interior. This is that central corridor space that we began to talk about. Um, and you can see here, there's a, this is a central wet area. So all of the classrooms share this space. So everyone comes through this space, but it also acts as the corridor in the distance. You can see sort of a desk where students could work. Um, and then in the opposite direction, you have um, upholstered couches where there might be a more comfortable or one-on-one -on -one kind of story time element that occurs. And you, it creates this really nice, um, I guess, layering of space within the corridor from that simple gesture of zigzagging um, the plan. Um, I guess by contrast, we have these really very warm, I guess, colours that extend from the facade into the corridor. And to contrast that, we went with quite cool palettes um, for the classroom interiors and again, um, using the, the ceiling form to, to bring natural light into the floor plan and even things like operable walls. Um, yeah, so the classrooms can either be shut off into individual classrooms or opened right up and become a large shared classroom between um, the two teachers. And that's it, I think. I think that's everything. All right. <laughs>